Now we're going to talk about Edouard de Beaumont, supposedly the inventor of the Beaumont rifle. Now, these guns are kind of curious. Uh, I've seen them around. They're common. It was another gun, <coughs> kind of an unusual design, and then eventually in the 50s, 60s, they were brought into the U.S. and sold as surplus. Uh, with ammunition and everything. You don't see people shoot them that much or talk about them that much. Uh, but the thing is, after doing some research and getting to uh, a website in the Netherlands and getting it in English and reading about it, these are pretty interesting guns with a very interesting story to them. But you have to know about Dutch arms manufacturing history to get into the story and this guy Beaumont that showed up with this design. Um, they're actually a neat rifle. You can still get them fairly reasonable but the price is going up on these things just like all of them. Uh, the more interest there is in them the higher the price goes up. So let's do a little bit. I've done the history of the uh, of Vetterly, and I told you who Vitali is. Now we're going to look into who Beaumont is and a little bit of background on the gun and how it was manufactured and there's things about lawsuits involving Chaspo and everybody else in this uh, at one time. So it's a pretty interesting story and I will try to put the link to this page up. I found it once and it took me forever to find it again but I got it and I got it in English and I'll basically read over it with you, go over the highlights and give you some background into Beaumont and how this weapon came about. Alright, as this document goes, uh, this is what it looks like. The arms industry in the Netherlands and Belgium in the 19th century, an introduction to reconstruction of a piece of industrial heritage. Uh, and this is Edouard Eddie D. Beaumont. While Liege survived, Maastricht fell into oblivion. Alright, the history of the weapons industry for portable firearms in the Netherlands is infested with legends and myths. This is particularly true for the arms industry in Maastricht. Uh, Time for a further investigation. This site focuses on answering the following questions. What aspects have contributed to the rise and fall of arms industry in Maastricht in the 19th century? And how did these aspects influence each other? From this, several research problems follow. At its core, it is simple. Where did the Dutch army get its rifles and pistols from? How were they purchased and production processes interrelated and in who were involved? In this, we have to remember the Netherlands included Belgium up until 1830, which means that Liege, the ancient industrial heartland of firearms production. Okay, but what happened after the Belgian succession? In the times of the Dutch Republic, guns were produced in the factory in the Dutch town of Kloenenburg, which was finally closed by orders of Napoleon. Okay, And then at the birth of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Prince William of Orange bought his arms in Birmingham, England, the so-called Brown Bess. After the kingdom was well established, there was only one place to go, Liege, where else? In Belgium. The brown best was phased out and replaced by an improved version of the French model 1777. Okay. Alright, so after the Belgian succession, the Liege factories were lost to the Netherlands. The gun factories of De Villers was looted, while the other one like Malabry and the, I can't pronounce it, saw a loss in their trade. The former gun factory at Kluenberg no longer existed. The gun shop at Delft was nothing more than a workshop. So the government had addressed companies like uh, Spannenberg in Germany, 
Also Dutch companies were favored with orders and relations between Belgium and the Netherlands somewhat stabilized. The Walloos came back into the race for their orders. Okay, it states here that, you know, political technological advancement in 1840, they had to go from flintlocks to uh, percussion. And the transformation already in use in 1841, the contract was ordered to the Maastricht great entrepreneur, Petrus Rigault. Okay. It took just a year before Rigault quitted the failure of Rigault led by the creation of gunmakers workshops in Maastricht. Okay, but the government took the decision to eliminate them. The Maastricht businessman Petrus Stevens started a factory of his own in 1849, this is something you got to remember, which was fully operational by 1850. The headquarters was located in Maastricht. The gun barrels were produced in a mill in Ode Vohoven. Unlike Regal, Stevens was not unacquainted with the manufacturing of weapons and components. But as early as 1836, he was already active in the field, okay? After, his, after the death of Stevens in 1863, his works or his factory gradually declined. Although the company was involved in the, involved in the transformation of rifles from muzzle loaders to breech loaders, the Snyder, that's the uh, Dutch Snyders, a fine example of 19th century weaponry. But the days of integrated production were no more while assembling guns over more and more. Okay. All right, they didn't produce guns, they were converting guns. So the factory shifted from one to the other. So in 1869, the army was busy testing uh, a new breech loader of a small caliber which was going to have to replace the Snyder rifle. The tests were underway and a third Maastricht citizen come out of the blue and finally the weapon presented by him came out on top. When that, you see the translation's weird, when that model was adopted for various army units, Edouard de Beaumont, who had no factory of his own, had the rifle manufactured in France. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870 messed things up so much, so the production shifted to Sol and was continued by a consortium, Messer, Simon, Look, Globe, Charlotte. The Germans were making the gun. Okay, now, Edward Beaumont, this is where we get into the interesting thing. So, Basically, this guy showed up, said he had a gun, the government liked it, went to manufacture it. He was having it made uh, in France, but then the war broke out, so he had the Germans make it, and this is where things get weird. Edward D. Beaumont was a jack-of-all-trades, but what made him stand, standing out of the crowd was he earned international fame. For years, he said to be the inventor of the Beaumont rifle. However, on March 24, 2006, during a symposium of D, whatever it is, Edward Bono, Mr. W.A. Dreschler showed the world an American patent from 1870. Be it known that I, John Joseph Close of Liege, in the Kingdom of Belgium have invented a new improvement in breech loading firearms. Close did it as the inventor but also as a signer to Edward de Beaumont of the same place. This ended all previous speculations regarding to the question whether de Beaumont was or was not the in inventor. On his terms, Close was inspired by the French gun designer and Antoni Chaspo and Mauser, the Norse system. However, 
the arms factory of P. Stevens, Maastricht, now continued by his four sons, experienced a revival when it was favored with orders for the Beaumont rifle. This was a great this, to the great dismay of de Beaumont, several court cases followed. De Beaumont took Stevens to court, violating his patent, and lost. Chaspo was also sent back to Paris after losing against de Beaumont in a similar case. So they were all suing each other, who the hell invented this gun? Eventually all lost. The production of the Beaumont rifle quickly came to an end. Although Stevens did get some orders for revolvers from officers, the factory declined rapidly. After Emile Stevens died in 1879, the factory was sold to Edward D. Beaumont and his partner Leonard Soleil. Uh, I don't know. Commotion arose when in 1888 the government was on the brink of awarding a contract for the two Francati of Liege for the third biggest operation of the century, the transformation of the Beaumont rifle into a rep uh, repeater according to the system of the Italian Vitali. Backed up by the media and his contract eventually went to Maastricht. However, this could not save the factory. In 1890, Edward D. Beaumont bought his partner out. Not being able to come up with innovative products, activities virtually came to a standstill. An attempt by a third party to establish a new factory in Maastricht was shot to nothing. Henceforth, the demise of Edward D. Beaumont in 1895, a long tradition of gun making, making in Maastricht dating back to the 17th century, came to an end. Okay. Ah, now here we go on. According to the German, Borsen and whatever, in 1875, the Beaumont rifle was amongst the five best military rifles in Europe at the time. Next to the Mauser, the Verdel, and the Berdan. Okay, so the Mauser, probably 71. Verder, that's that weird, I know what that is, I can't pronounce it right. And the Berdan, Russian, and the Graf French rifle. A choice out of 26 different kinds of breech loaders at the time, in use by the various European army. Okay, it was a bunch of five. Okay, so the top five was the Mauser, the Verdo, the Berdan, the Grasse, and the Beaumont. Top five picks, according to the Germans. A lot of action, the Beaumont, yeah, a lot of action, the Beaumont rifle, fortunately, did not see it. Oh, okay. The, he's saying that the gun didn't see a lot of use in military conflict. So a lot of action the Beaumont rifle, unfortunately, did not see. One of the few wars it was it has been in was the Eshu War, which raged on and off between 1873 and 1914 in the former Dutch colony of Indonesia. So the gun seen combat use in Indonesia. First praised for its user's friendliness and his impact, later disliked because it was already outdated in 1895 and was replaced by the uh, Manlicker Rifle 95. Nowadays it remains a collector's item. Next to original equipment manufacturers, OEM, both Stevens and De Beaumont were also ordinary traders and marketed a wide range of other products both for professional and for consumer markets such as bayonets, machetes, sables, and shotguns. Okay, while the gebeer work or the gun works in Delft was gradually moved to Hamburg hence the government finally got what it always wanted, an arms factory within a within the fortress Amsterdam. Okay, the artillery in 
I can't pronounce that, as it became known, was a modest factory, but production of assault rifles called the MR-10, the predecessor of the famous American M-16, could have made something big out of it, but again, due to circumstances, it was not going to be. Finally, this gun production facility came to close in 1963 as the government awarded an order for the new FN rifles to Liege area, full circle. Okay. So, that's our story. Well, in closing, it looks interesting. It looks like the Netherlands had a troubled manufacturing history. I do remember that Belgium succeeded from one other European country, but I didn't know it was the Netherlands. I forgot that. So, as we all know, Belgian gun makers are world famous. So, the manufacturing section that the Netherlands had at one time before 1830s was lost with the succession of Belgium. And Beaumont, kind of sounds to me, somehow he weaseled into this design and was actually sued by uh, Chaspo. I'm surprised Mauser didn't say anything. And uh, they all sued, and he sold Stevens, the arms manufacturer, for making his gun because the government awarded a contract to him for patent infringement. And they all lost, and he ended up owning the company. Pretty interesting. And you see, the manufacturing was one thing. And then the conversion later on was a process done, but that was it. The Dutch really didn't design guns because the M95s, the first batch, minor marked, they were made in Steyr in Austria before they started producing their own firearms uh, in the country. Quite interesting. So that is a Dutch website, and I didn't know that. And I didn't know that the Germans considered the Beaumont rifle up there with the Mauser, the Vertel, or whatever, that's that Bavarian thing with the weird, the Gra and the, uh, what was it, Top 5, I might do a video on that, Top 5, Mauser, Vertel, oh, Verdon, and Gra. So those were the Top 5 rifles, okay, which is, they are fun to shoot. And we'll, we'll start working on that. That's why I'm making these videos. And we're going to work to that. And maybe I'll do a shoot-off. I don't have Werner. Okay. A Bavarian. That's right. They're from Bavaria. I don't have one of them yet. I got a Berdan, a Gra, and I got the 71. And we can take them all out and give a... And I got the 7184. So we can give them a competition. Top 5 of the 18... 1875, top five military rifles of Europe from 1875. Sounds like a good video to work on. All right, so there's an interesting story. A lot of that I didn't know. I'm going to try to put a link to this down there. You can convert it over into English uh, and, and read it. It's interesting reading. Okay, so that covers all my historical things. And now we're going to start talking about the guns uh, in depth.